Good morning and welcome. It is so exciting to have everyone back on campus this morning and to have this opportunity to gather together. If you're looking for a seat, big surprise, we have lots here in the front that are available. Um, but the added incentive is there's actually an agenda sitting on those seats. So uh, there is a prize if you, if you come to the front. Thank you so much. So I don't want to delay getting started this morning because our special speaker has a flight that she has to catch pretty quickly, and so we want to maximize her time. But I do want to begin by welcoming everyone to our opening day and just to recognize some special guests that we have with us today. First of all, we have two members of our Board of Trustees with us. This is Mary Strobridge. And our Board President, Mr. Pete Sizak. Also joining us today is our Superintendent President Emeritus, Dr. Gil Stark. Because we are on a quick timeline today, we are not going to pause and take a formal break. You are welcome to get up and use the facilities as you need. They are located in the lobby where you entered. And in case of emergency, we have exits at the back where you entered and also on the sides that will take you into a vestibule that leads to a hallway that leads to outside. <laughs> so uh, there are multiple ways to exit the building if needed. At this time, I would like to introduce Quay Dane, our Director of Equity and Student Success Centers, who is going to formally introduce our speaker today. Quay? Good morning. Welcome back, everyone. We're super excited for opening day, and I'm so honored to uh, introduce our guest speaker today as we launch into the fall semester and really uh, envision a college campus that is truly equitable and inclusive. Um, I want to present Dr. Allie Michael. She is the co-founder and director of the Race Institute for K-12 Educators and the author of Raising Race Questions, Whiteness, Inquiry, and Education, winner of the 2017 Society of Professors of Education Outstanding Book Award. She is also the co-editor of the best-selling Everyday White People Confront Racial and Social Injustice, 15 Stories, and best-selling Guide for White Women Who Teach Black Boys. She also sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Whiteness and Education, Ali teaches in the Diversity and Inclusion Program at Princeton University, and as well as Equity Institutes at USC. She may be best known for her piece, What Do We Tell the Children, on the Huffington Post, where she is a regular contributor. Uh, we really spent a lot of time thinking about what was the most appropriate uh, speaker for today, and we really believe that uh, we're very fortunate to have Ali speak. Um, I'm going to have Dr. Curtis come in and talk about a few words before she comes up, but please give us a warm welcome to Dr. Ali Michael. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, so I have a brief story, and with apologies to those of you who were at either event yesterday, you've heard the story, um, but... Allie and I have talked about it, and she feels like it's a, it's a good way to start off the morning and set the tone for her talk, so I'm going to go ahead and share it again. And the story is this. Uh, a few weeks back, I was on a short vacation, uh, trying to get ready for the semester, and my family and I were on an Amtrak back from Seattle to Slow, and it was the, the morning. We were in the, in the dining car eating breakfast. And it was just uh, my wife and daughter and I, and so there was room at the table for a fourth person, and they try to be efficient, don't we all? So um, they added a single rider to our table, and he was a young man of Indian descent, parents had immigrated here, worked in the tech industry in uh, the Bay Area, and so we were just having a nice conversation over breakfast until uh, I became increasingly aware I was sitting at the aisle, I became aware of the conversation across the aisle from us. 
and there was an old man talking with a, another elderly couple, and they were talking about immigration and extolling the virtues of the president's immigration policies, and, and that's fine, but they were a little loud and um, pretty pointed in their comments, and at one point the, the old man said, I don't know what it's gonna take to get these people to stop. I guess we're just gonna have to shoot a couple. Yeah, that was my thought. Um, I don't know how he feels about his comment in the light of what happened this weekend. I don't know if he even remembers making the comment. I certainly do remember his comment um, for two reasons. The, the first is that as I've reflected on this over the last couple weeks, it's occurred to me that as a, as a white kid growing up in Orange County, Republican stronghold during the Reagan era, um, I've never experienced overhearing a conversation where someone has suggested that the solution to a problem is to shoot me or someone like me. And yet our students of color have potentially had to deal with that multiple times during their educational journey before they arrive here at Cuesta. And the second thing is, you know, here I am, a, a, a community college administrator who wants to learn more about how to support students of color, trying to do things to champion diversity and, and inclusivity. And in that moment, I did not have the courage, I would say, um, others will give you another term, Allie will give you another term later. I didn't have the courage or the tools to really do anything, so we just continued our conversation with our table mate and tried to block out what was going on across the aisle from us. And that's bothered me a lot over the last few weeks, and I've continued to think about it. And so I particularly cherish Allie's message because she's gonna talk with us about what to do as a white person when you're confronted with situations like that. So without further ado, um, I'm gonna bring Allie up to the stage. like he was suggesting, Dr. Curtis was suggesting that I had a bad word for it. Yeah. <laughs> I call it courage, Allie has another word for it, you know. But I don't, I mean, I, the word I have for it is competency, that, that I think when we lack competency, sometimes it's, it's hard to have the courage to speak up, not because we don't want to, but because we don't know what to do. And so we swallow it and we sit there and that's hard. I contend in this scenario that Dr. Curtis shared, Maybe not saying anything in that moment was the right thing because he wasn't putting his table mate at further risk. But the question I, I want to challenge all of us to think about is what if he didn't have a table mate of color sitting there with him and it was all white people in the dining car? Seems to me that that actually might be the more important time to, to act, to say something. And um, you know, when it's only white people, sometimes white people hear racism that it, people of color aren't exposed to, and it's this particularly unique opportunity to speak up and say something. Um, I am just so grateful to Dr. Curtis for sharing that story with us, um, because I think that um, it, it helps us to situate ourselves today. Why are we talking about race? And um, the, I have titled this talk, Building the Beloved Community. The Beloved Community is actually a term from Martin Luther King that um, Bell Hooks also has written about. The Beloved Community, it, I, I mean, the Beloved Community is, is not just a place where we love each other. It's a community where we have each other's backs and where we recognize that each of us is vulnerable to different forms of oppression. And so in the beloved community, uh, this is a place where men stick up for women's rights. It's a place where heterosexual people stand up against homophobia and cisgender people stand up against transphobia. And it's a, it's a place where white people stand up against racism. And it's a place where able-bodied people stand up against um, the oppression of people with disabilities. 
it's a it's a place where um, people who are middle or upper middle or upper class might, will stand up for working people's rights. So the beloved community is a place where essentially you say, what power do I have in this society, and how can I use the power I have to make sure that people are safe that they're able to show up in my community whole, where they don't have to hide parts of who they are, um, and where they have equal opportunity. And so for me, this vision of the beloved community is something worth working for. And so I title this talk, Building the Beloved Community, because I'm here to talk about race and, and whiteness. And I think that sometimes people hear that and think, oh God, this is gonna be really painful, and people are gonna be sad or frustrated or angry, or like somebody said last night, I'm gonna get it wrong. Um, and so why even bother? It's just basically my blood pressure goes through the roof. I don't wanna be in this conversation. And for me, I used to think that race conversations were actually, that that was the point, that we get together and we feel bad together. I would feel guilty, and if I could, I'd make other people feel guilty. And that was like, that's really what's called, that's what I'm called to do. Like for racial justice is to feel bad about myself as a white person. That's what I thought was the goal of these conversations because that was always what ended up happening. And it was really powerful to, to kind of stay in the conversation long enough to hear that that's not the goal. The goal is the beloved community. The goal is to create a place where everybody can show up and be their whole selves, be safe, um, and have equal opportunity. And so um, the beloved community for me is a vision worth getting out of bed for. Um, and it doesn't mean I don't still sometimes feel guilty or sad. It just means that when I feel those things, I know it's in the service of something greater. <coughs> and so, so that's what I'll be talking about for the next hour. I have to also just make a, a note that um, not only is, is um, San Luis Obispo one of the friendliest places I've been, <coughs> and one of the most beautiful places I've been, but you are so timely. I, I get it. Like, it, I'm supposed to talk, start my talk at 9.30. It's 9.30. <laughs> and so I, I'm thrilled with that, because usually um, we start 20 minutes later than I'm supposed to start, and the talk is much shorter. So I will still be efficient, um, like Amtrak, but um, I'm just going to honor that uh, we're all winning, because it's already 9.30. So I want to share a little bit about my own personal story and why I study whiteness. Um, because to be honest, you know, sometimes I'll be in a lift on the way to an event and the driver will say, so what are you going to be talking about? And I have to consider, like, does this person want to hear about whiteness? They might not want to hear about You know, sometimes it's awkward to make that the first thing that I say to people, but when we only have an hour and 10 minutes, then I have to, uh, you know, we're going to get right to it. Um, and I know that it's an awkward topic because when, uh, there, are, there have been many years of my life when even saying the word white made me uncomfortable. It was awkward. I didn't want to self-identify as white. I remember the first book I read that had white in the title. Um, it was called, um, it was by Janet Helms, and it, it, was, it was something about getting to know your whiteness or something. And I was reading on the subway in New York City and I always covered it with something because I just thought nobody, nobody, I don't want anyone to know that I'm reading this book. Um, I, I grew up in a predominantly white town. It was 99.8% white. It was in, in Mount Lebanon, which is in, uh, it's a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I grew up around all white people. My family's all white. But um, we never used that term to describe ourselves. And recently I was interviewing teenagers for some research we're doing on how white families socialize their children around race. And he said, oh, I, I'm not white, I'm just normal. <laughs> and I thought, I relate to that because when I was 17, that's probably what I would have said because the term white, didn't, it didn't resonate with me. I had never heard, there was no, white was a term for white supremacists, frankly, people who, who embrace their whiteness are, are people who are white supremacists. And so for the rest of us, it feels like, well, that's just not a term that I'm gonna use to describe myself. 
Um, but white was not the only term we didn't use when I was growing up. We also, we didn't talk about race, period. We saw race and racism as somebody else's issue and something that doesn't concern us. And so it wasn't until I got to college and somebody, somebody, you know, I was going to these race conversations and I was listening to the experiences of people of color and nodding and listening sympathetically. Um, and someone turned to me and said, so what about you, Allie? What's, what's your racial story? And I mean, it had never occurred to me that I would have a racial story. So I just fumbled my way stuttering through this question. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I, I, um, I don't think I have a racial story because my parents didn't use racial slurs. So, you know, and we're colorblind. We treat everybody equally. So what really is there what, what would my racial story be? What could a white person's racial story be? And so I started studying whiteness in part to figure out what is my racial story? Um, and how has being white impacted my life? The second reason why I study whiteness is that um, I am in, I'm situated in the field of education and so it through different grad programs in education uh, I would take classes on race and education, and they were not classes on race at large. They were classes on students and communities of color. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Those are important classes, but I found myself thinking, so we're going to talk about students of color and outcomes for students of color, but we're not going to talk about the fact that 85% of our teachers are white? That has to be part of the equation of thinking about race and education. More than 85% of our administrators are white in the U.S. Most of our policymakers and curriculum writers are white. So if we're not talking about whiteness in education, there's this whole piece that we're missing. And yet, for so many reasons, we don't talk about it. It's awkward. Um, it's it's uh, a term that has, by and large, been appropriated by white supremacists. And, um, it's, I think it's mostly invisible to white people. So I was thinking about this last night. Um, right, I have two kids, they're six and nine, and we're going through the Harry Potter. Uh, uh, well, we've only made it to book three, and then it got so scary that I think we had to take a few years off, uh, to be totally honest. Uh, but we've been reading the Harry Potter books aloud as a family, and I was really struck in the first book uh, you get to a page in the 60s and you meet a new character who's described as, um, as black. And it's so striking that you, you, like you, you've met Ron and Hermione and Harry and nobody is described as white and then you meet a black character. Um, and it was just striking to me that people of color um, often have their racial background named and pointed out, but white people, by and large, don't. I think that's starting to change, but for the most part, in newspaper articles and lots of fictional uh, books, if a person, if somebody is white, it's unnamed, but if somebody is a person of color, the author or the writer will go out of their way to give you descriptors <coughs> to let you know this person um, is a person of color. So white uh, kind of becomes the default. In the same way that heterosexuality in our society becomes the default. I think mainstream identities tend to be the default, and if you don't fit the default, then it's pointed out. And the same thing is, is, um, happens with whiteness. And so for all of these reasons, I talk about whiteness and I bring it up because for me, it, it helps me feel, it helps me see myself as part of the racial equation in the US. It, may, it makes me realize that I'm part of the problem and therefore I'm also part of the solution. And there's a quote from James Baldwin that I heard early on that has really spoken to me. He said, um, racism is actually not a people of color problem. It's a white person problem. And nothing's gonna change until white people do something about it. Um, and this was so powerful to me because in my childhood growing up, I just assumed that racism had nothing to do with me, like I said. But as I've learned in the, in the um, years since then, what I've realized is uh, being white has impacted every single day of my life. And um, again, so I thought, if my parents don't use racial slurs, what is it about being white that I should talk about? 
Let, I'll tell you a couple of things. So, so being white has meant that, um, it, especially when I was growing up, 90% of the books that I read had white protagonists. So not only did I see myself in books, but I could choose pretty much any book I wanted and see myself uh, as you know part of that fantasy or part of that adventure or part of even that, um, uh, basically any story. Um, I see myself in movies and historical heroes and in the, the people that we see as leaders in our country who are white people. And so I tend to see myself reflected everywhere. Um, but then there's really systemic and structural ways in which being white has impacted my life. So I told you I grew up in the suburbs. Um, I grew up in a suburb of Pittsburgh that was by and large not accessible to people of color. Um, there were multiple reasons why uh, there were bank mortgages were often not available to people who uh, lived in predominantly black areas. Um, there was also a lot of individual level violence that kept people of color out of my community. Now my parents weren't involved in that, but they probably didn't even know about it. Um, but I think the thing for me to realize is that all white communities like the one I grew up in don't happen by accident. There's actually a lot of historical uh, policy and law that goes into creating those spaces. Um, so my, uh, my grandparents uh, accessed the GI Bill uh, and, and they were able to buy a house in the suburbs of DC when, right after World War II. And then they held, they held onto their house for 30 years. So Bethesda is a sleepy little suburb of DC. Nobody knew about it um, in the 1950s. Uh, it, today, property there it has um, gone up hundreds of thousands of dollars in value. And so when my grandparents sold their house, they were able to help me and my cousins go to college. Now this is, this is, this was a community that they, that only white people were allowed to buy into. And so all of that accrual of value um, was related to our whiteness. And I share this not because I think this is the story of all white people, because it's not. Um, not all white people have class privilege. And I think that's really important because when we talk about this word privilege, people get frustrated and confused. Like, well, I'm not wealthy, so how could, how could I have racial privilege? I think the term racial privilege, it doesn't mean you have money. It just means that you might, um, there might be a different reward system for you based on your racial background. And, um, and so I share this to point out the ways in which whiteness is part of my story. And if you're white, chances are good whiteness is also part of your story. But it's going to be very individual and unique to you. Uh, but it's a, it's a question, an invitation that I, ish, that I offer you to think about how is whiteness part of your story? Uh, so let me share a couple other things. Uh, I heard, I, you heard recently this morning in my introduction that I co-edited this book, The Guide for White Women Who Teach Black Boys, and a couple of people have asked me to share some tips and strategies from this book. And so I'm gonna, I'll share a couple things, but I'm gonna start with two that really frame the rest of this talk. First of all, um, this is our editorial team. And my colleague, Dr. Eddie Moore Jr., who's in the middle, likes to say, this is what it looks like after you publish a book. <laughs> We're so happy. We like each other so much. But we had a lot of conflict in, during the time that we were, we were writing the book um, and editing it. We have over 80 contributors, in part because the question of how white women can be effective teachers of black male students is it's complicated. There are millions of answers. And... Um, and they don't, they're not all going to be completely coherent because if you ask a complex question, you're going to get complex answers. And so um, not every chapter in the book aligns with every other chapter, and that's okay because the question is a complex one. Um, and, I, and I say that because I think as you ask race questions on this campus, there's not always going to be one right answer. They're going to be multifaceted. People are going to have different opinions. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes people will say, well, what do you think about Robin D'Angelo? She has a different approach from you. And what do you think about this person? You, you approach the subject differently. And I always say, you know, racism is so big that there are actually a lot of ways that we can address it. <laughs> and it's really important that we address it in a lot of different ways. So that's what we were trying to do in this book. But for you as educators, um, these were the two main uh, 
strategies that came out of that book. The first is um, get to know black excellence. And I know that you have uh, more Latinx students than you have black students here. And so I would say the same thing. If you're thinking about how do I as a white educator support my Latinx students, get to know Latinx excellence. Learn about the people and the events uh, who have shaped uh, Latinx history and identity in this country. And in this case, to, to, um, this is a slide we used when we we're, we're talking about our book, to really, um, you know, I, I recently was talking with a parent who had never heard of Paul Robeson. Paul Robeson was a, not only an athlete and a scholar, which many, many young people today don't realize you can be both, he was also an opera singer. And so, it, which is, is um, you know, often seen as the polar opposite of, of, of being an athlete. Um, but to hold up examples of men, who, of people who have done, um, who, who really demonstrate excellence. Um, and, and not just to hold it up for students, but to hold them up for yourself. To get to know black excellence so you know what, or to Latinx excellence, so you know what is it that you're striving for? What is it that you're, what, what your students are capable of and that you could support them towards? The second thing, the second tip comes from our authors. And so this was this interesting thing that happened when we were editing this book that we, we sent out a call for chapters. We got about 60 chapters back. Some of them were co-written. Co and almost every chapter said, if you as a white woman want to know how to teach black boys, you have to know yourself. And it was, it was striking. And we sent all the chapters back and said, this is going to be a really boring book. You can't, <laughs> not everybody can write about the same topic. Um, so we, we kept that theme in about six or seven of the chapters. And we asked authors to address something else. But it was so striking that the biggest tip for teaching and supporting black boys in education was know yourself as a white educator. And so taking that mandate, I really see it as a mandate from the authors of the chapters in this book, I'm going to share more about getting to know uh, what, it, what does it mean to understand what it means to be white. Um, that's a tall order, and so I'm going to talk about that um, in, in, for us in this context, knowing that not everybody here is white, but that you have a predominantly white campus, and so that like so many schools in the country, this could be useful to you. So I'm going to talk about whiteness from the perspective of racial identity development. And racial identity development comes from psychology. And the idea is essentially that uh, racial identity development is part of human development. And each of us has a racial identity that informs the way that we navigate the, um, the, our understanding of racism. A uh, definition of racial identity development is the process of defining for oneself the personal significance and social meaning of belonging to a particular racial group. So it's about figuring out, for me, what does it mean to be white and what do I do with that? Um, before I share more about racial identity development, I also just want to make a note because this is a central conflict in my own learning. I, I actually, my master's was in anthropology and education. And then um, my PhD is in teacher education, but for a long time I focused on psychology. And what I found was anthropology and psychology does not mix well. <laughs> because anthropologists are constantly talking about the fact that race is socially constructed. It's not real. There's no biological basis for race. In fact, one, oh, oh, one way that they demonstrate this is that um, in the South, during, the, during Jim Crow, in one state, in order to be black, you had to be a quarter black. So one of your grandparents had to be black. In the neighboring state, in order to be black, you had to be one sixteenth black, which means one of your great grandparents was black. And so you could literally cross state lines and your racial designation would change. And we know when your racial designation changed, everything else changes, you, where you can access school, what hospitals you can access, where you can, um, whether you can vote, whether you can sit on a jury, whether you can uh, make laws, whether you can, in some cases, own property, where you can work. I mean, everything changes. 
and it's based on how is blackness and whiteness defined in this state, officially, and how is it defined in this state. There's no biological basis for race. We, we did a lot of, um, we made a lot of laws and policy based on skin color, but we didn't, um, but, but we made it a lot, basically. So in anthropology, this is really important because, um, you know, people are doing DNA tests today and realizing, actually, I'm part a lot of different things. I'm actually a multiracial person, and here I thought I was white my whole life, because white is a made-up thing. And yet, um, when I drive down the street and I go speeding past a police officer and I don't get pulled over, it, is it because, I mean, I don't know why, but somehow I'm not seen as a threat. Um, and I think it's related to being a woman and it's related to being white and maybe it's related to driving a white car or a black car. I don't have a red car. I hear red cars get pulled over more than any other car. Um, but it's amazing. It, because I speed, first of all. I, I, um, I shared this with the faculty yesterday. I have been a speeder my whole life. I, I have anxiety. <laughs> I think that's why I drive fast. But I've never been pulled over. So last year I got pulled over for the first time ever. Um, I was driving 92 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. And I was in upstate New York. And to be fair, it was 11 o'clock, it was like a Thursday morning, there was an eight lane highway, there was nobody on the road, and I couldn't even tell I was going fast, because there were no markers saying, you know, it was just all trees. And um, I was, there was nobody, I was speeding past. And, um, but I, this was the first time I ever got pulled over, and I deserved it. And in the moment I was thinking, I am so glad this is finally happening because I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> He's actually older now, but he uh, grew up in Vancouver, Washington, and he's black. And uh, by the time he was 18, he had been pulled over 17 times. So he'd been driving for two years. Um, and and I have and so this is the lived experience of race. This is one of many examples. Uh, so. Uh, in psychology, the reason I was drawn to psychology courses is because they would say, how do you deal with the stress of being pulled over multiple times? Especially if one of those times was uh, you experienced abuse or violence and then you carry that PTSD with you into being pulled over other times. How do you deal with the stress of, of people continuously not recognizing you or mi mistaking your name for somebody else's name? Um, Psychology is about racial identity development. I'm pointing to the laptop as if you can see it. <laughs> Psychology is about racial identity development, about how you handle experiencing racism and how you keep yourself psychologically safe in the midst of that. And in anthropology, I just found that, you know, it's really important that I know that these categories are made up, that they're a fiction, and yet it doesn't help teachers in a classroom talking to a student, both of whom experience race as very real. Both of whom know racism shapes our lives. So finally I just said to my anthropology professor, could we just have a debate between your department and the psychology department? Because I don't really know, I, I just don't know, I can't kind of make these two things mesh. And she said, they do mesh, but we have to just constantly see them at two different levels, that one's the meta level of our society and one's the individual level experience. And so I say that because I want, I, I'm going to be going into the psychology and it's the individual level experience. And it doesn't mean that race is somehow real or permanent, but it does, but it is about recognizing how much racism shapes our lives, even if it's based on a false construct. Um, incidentally, there are other things in our society that are also false constructs <laughs> that, um, that we talk about anyway, and that we sometimes pretend to be anyway, even though we know they're fictions, because, um, because they just have so much social meaning, and race is the same way. Okay, so with that caveat, white racial identity development coming from psychology says that white people go through certain stages 
of understanding what it means to be white. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna just share some of my own story as I go through these stages. Um, these, this framework was developed by two uh, black women psychologists, uh, first developed by Dr. Janet Helms and then popularized by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum, who is most recently the president of Spelman College. She also wrote Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, which is not only about blackness and whiteness, but it's about racial identity development. And if you haven't read it, it's very useful for understanding, especially our students. So a negative, basically the framework goes from negative racial identity to a positive racial identity. And it, negative is not a judgmental term. It's not like bad. Negative means, it's more like in photography, like there's the absence of an image. So a negative racial identity is basically having no idea that you're white. So this is me for the first 18 years of my life. Not knowing that you're white, not knowing that it impacts your life, and essentially say, I just want to treat everybody the same and have a, and, and I want to be colorblind. And this is what my dad said for many, many years in my early 20s. I want to be colorblind. I would go home and say, what about this? We talked about this in college. Let's talk about this. And he would say, no, we just treat everybody the same. And, um, and the thing that, is, that psychologists say about a, a negative racial identity is that it's necessarily delusional. And here's what they mean by that. We live in a society that's, that's heavily shaped by race. We've had 500 years of racialized policies. We have a media and publishing industries that are really dominated by images of whiteness and by not only a, a, a dearth of images of people of color, but when we get them, they're often stereotypical or negative. And so we don't even realize how much we're taking in negative messages, but when I was growing up in that all-white town, I lived uh, about 10 miles away from an almost all-black town. It was called The Hill in Pittsburgh. It's actually where all of August Wilson's plays take place. And um, I, my understanding of The Hill was that it's dangerous. It's a place full of gang warfare. We had tons of suburban legends about all the bad things that would happen to you if you went there. And, and, I, and, I, and it fit with all of the stereotypes that I got from the media about who black people are. It's dangerous, it's scary, don't go there, don't buy property there, certainly don't just get lost there on a, you know, on a random day. And um, it was so scary to me in my body that we would drive past, well, uh, drive past the hill and I would feel nervous, even being on the highway, passing by. Um, because I internalized all the negative press that I took in about black people. And I didn't know any actual black people who disconfirmed the stereotype. And so the reason why negative racial identity is delusional and why I was delusional is I thought that was the truth about black people and black communities because that was all the input I was getting. And I didn't have any um, impetus to challenge those ideas. I thought white communities were safe, I thought black communities were unsafe. Um, and that was, uh, and, and then I have a lot of bias, unco unconscious bias that comes from that. So contact is like, is basically in that range where contact is like your first contact with the notion that racism exists. And so for some people that happens in um, a professional development training or in, um, you know, at work, I'll often hear from white people who say, like, my contact moment was in college, just like you, Allie. Um, what I hear from people of color more often is, my contact moment was when I was five years old. My friend Matthew Subramanian says, my contact moment was at the sandbox in kindergarten. Somebody said, you can't play here, your skin is too dark. And it was that, for her, was her contact, like, oh, skin color matters and I have the wrong one? Oh. Okay, I, I better pay attention to this. So this is really significant because people of color tend to experience an understanding that racism exists at a very young age. And throughout their lives, often, not everybody, often have to contend with racism in order to survive. Whereas white people often don't learn about racism, and it's not true for all white people. There are many white people with multiracial families who learn about this early, um, or who live in multiracial communities and so they know about it. But many white people grow up in pretty segregated places and don't really have to contend with racism. And I always thought I wasn't good at talking about racism 
because I was white. Like, I'll never be good at it because I'm white and white people are just doomed to be bad at talking about racism. People of color, no matter what they say, they're right. And that's actually not the case. And it's not the case that people of color are just somehow biologically good at talking about racism. It's that if you deal with something every day, you build skills around it. You get better at talking about it. But as a white person, I am not going to just get better at it because racism doesn't land on my doorstep every morning. And that's part of why I acknowledge that that's, that that's privilege, but it also means I'm not building skills. So when I then am in a conversation about race and racism, I feel like, oh, what do I say? I don't know how to do this. I'm going to get this wrong. I don't have the right thing. I guess I'll sit here and be quiet. Um, all of that um, is because of my, of my lack of exposure. So contact, um, contact is a stage that can bring up a lot of things for people. It can make people feel guilty or feel like, why didn't I know this stuff before? And what it leads to is this stage called disintegration. And disintegration is basically a stage where um, your former worldview starts to disintegrate. So as soon as you learn about racism, and you hear a story like mine, where I can name so many, like I've worked hard every day of my life, but I'm also aware that there's a reward structure um, that made it possible so the more I worked, the more prizes I got, you know, degrees and awards. And um, there are some people who work hard every day of their life and don't get recognized for those things. Um, and sometimes, um, that can be demoralizing to real to start to realize like oh I real I thought I thought the world was fair that I should just be colorblind everything would be fine and that it's a meritocracy that we live in meritocracy if you work hard you get ahead and now I'm realizing I did work hard but I also partly got ahead because there were laws and policies that favored me and my group and so you start to disintegrate your former worldview starts to disintegrate and it feels really um, frustrating and you start to feel like you have one foot in two different worlds like at this foot my family and all the people I grew up with believe all this stuff um, about working hard getting ahead being you know whiteness having nothing to do with my life and this foot is on this other path where I'm learning all this new stuff at my work or at my college and I feel like if I stay on the two paths I'm gonna split in two because they feel incompatible and so this can be a very angst-provoking stage, and often people just reintegrate. So they say, you know what? I don't want to feel all that tension and sadness and whatever, so I'm just going to reintegrate my worldview the way it is. Um, but people in reintegration tend to feel like um, they tend to take those vulnerable feelings of sadness and, and anxiety and turn them into hostility and anger. So when people are in reintegration stage, they'll often say things like, you know, if people of color are having a hard time, it's not because there's like systemic racism, it's because there's something wrong with them. They're just lazy, or they're not, they're not getting it right, or they're not smart enough. People in reintegration stage will also say, to be white is to be wrong. So I'm just always gonna be wrong about this. Why do I even try? I'm not gonna try to get it right. I remember talking to my dad about colorblindness when I was 22, and trying to bring this, you know, trying to, I had gone to a conference, and I had heard uh, somebody talking about uh, why colorblindness is not helpful. And I said, Dad, I think you would really find this interesting. The speaker was saying that when, when we're colorblind, it makes it harder to really see the person standing in front of us because their racial background is part of who they are. And my dad said, why would, he, why would a white person even talk in something like that? Like, why would you even raise your... If a white person is in a talk on racism, they're, we're always going to be wrong, and they are always going to attack us. And I, I was almost crying, like, well, who's we? Who's they? When did it become us versus them? And we have been making so much good progress. Why, why are you <laughs> doing this, you know? And I called my sister, who, is, um, uh, who lives in New York City, and, and I told her everything that was happening, and she said, oh, yeah, sounds like Dad's reintegrating. <laughs> My sister is a big nerd, like I am, and um, and it was like, yes. So what does he need? Why? Well, that's exactly right. He's reintegrating, and she said, well, I think people in reintegration need support because they're trying not to feel the vulnerable feelings of sadness and anxiety, and so um, they need support to move through that stage. And so here's the thing: I am in reintegration a lot. And the reason I know I'm in reintegration is because I say in my head, I'm never going to get this right. 
Why do I even bother trying? And I do this regularly in relationships and in my work because I get, na I get critical feedback, which is you know, supposed to make me better at what I do. But it, what, what it does it, is it, it, I mean, I also take feedback, but it, it takes me personally to this little shame place where it's like, I'm never gonna get this right. And what I have to remember as, is that I'm in reintegration. And so I have to say to myself, get support. Find somebody in your life who can support you to talk this through and move through it. Because actually that feedback is going to help you be better and stronger, but not if you just drop out of this. Now you can't just drop out of this conversation. But, I, but those are the words that remind me I'm in reintegration. So these are the stages, the first three stages, the negative racial identity stages. And if you can hang in there, you start moving towards a positive racial identity. And pseudo-independence is like, I'm, I, I'm breaking free of the, the guilt and the sadness, and I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward, I'm gonna start learning, I'm gonna start taking action. But the thing, about, the, the thing that characterizes the pseudo-independence stage is that people tend to think about racism and not feel about it. So this is another stage I'm in most days. And I know that I think about racism and I don't feel about it because I, I feel about gender. So recently, I was talking to somebody in my community and they told me that the gym teacher at my children's middle school, my children are in um, first grade and fourth grade, but they said the gym teacher is creepy. And I was like, well, creepy how? And they said, well, you know, creepy with girls. And I felt my blood turn to ice. I literally felt it and I, went into panic mode and I texted my partner, we are moving, we are getting out of here, we put the house on the market, we have to leave. Because I, God, I am not sending my daughter to a school with a creepy gym teacher. And, and it was so striking to me that I had such a physiological reaction because I have heard so many stories from parents of color about the, the things that their students experience in schools and my blood never ran cold. And so this is making me realize that's part of my work, is to be able to feel about racism, not just think about it. Um, because I would act differently if I felt about it. The other thing about pseudo-independence is that um, you tend to see racism as an individual level thing. And this is how I grew up. Like, don't be racist because that's bad. And, and the people who are racist are in the KKK and they believe white people are superior to all other people and they use violence to get other people to, to buy into that system. And it's like, okay, check, don't do that. I'm fine, I'm cool, right? As long as I'm not doing that. And I didn't realize that racism is actually more systemic and is historically rooted and that it's institutionalized. So when I have power in institutions, I can actually, there's a lot I can do to make change, um, but not if I don't see the ways that racism is historical and systemic. And so pseudo-independence, you're still kind of stuck there, seeing racism as individual and also um, thinking about racism rather than feeling it. Immersion is just immersing yourself in learning. It's getting to the point where you say, I wanna learn. I'm gonna go to all the things, I'm gonna have a book group, I'm gonna immerse myself in figuring out what does it mean. It's also about emerging into a new white racial identity. And then autonomy is really the beloved community stage. And most, I mean, I feel like on most days I'm not there. But that's the stage where I'm a healthy, active, contributing member of a multiracial community where I am showing up and working against racism in ways that are supportive of my community members. And I say supportive of my community members to go back to Dr. Curtis's story because who knows what that young man at your table wanted you to do in that scenario. But I need to check in with people of color in my community if I'm gonna be starting to take action because the actions I take are probably going to impact them more than they impact me. But uh, autonomy is about, um, and having a positive racial identity is about proactive, taking action, um, and using whatever privilege or power I have to work against racism. So this is the framework. This is, and, 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 it's laid out as if it's very linear. It's actually much more like a game of shoots and ladders. You're up, you're down, you're all over the place. You slip on a banana peel, and you know. It's, it's just very, um, it's much more random. Or another way I like to think about it is that I'm in all the stages. So I learned something new about racism. My contact level is high, but I also am deep in a collaborative relationship with some people of color working against racism. So I also maybe have some higher levels of autonomy. Um, 
but my reintegration is high too because I make a microaggression and then I feel like garbage and then I think I should never do this again. And so, you know, it's just like I, I have all of the levels in me at the same time. So why is this important for us as people who work with students? Psychologists say that what you want to have is a progressive relationship. A progressive relationship means you have a more developed racial identity than the person, the student that you're working with. Um, but it comes from therapy, so the, the therapist is not going to be an effective therapist if they have a more, if, if, the, if the client is more developed in their racial identity than the therapist. That's what we call a regressive relationship, because the client's just more comfortable with a whole lot of things. So if I have a, a client or a student who's who's in integrative awareness, who didn't do the framework for people of color, but there's a lot of similarities. If I have a student of color who's in integrative awareness or in introspection, they're in these stages of identity development, and I'm still up in contact, and I'm like, well, race doesn't make, races, there is no, there is no racism, I'm just colorblind, I'm not, I don't want to talk about this. I can't support them on their racial identity journey. And it's my job to support my students um, in this very human process of identity development. And so my motivation for continuing to work through these stages and to try to work towards having a positive racial identity and being in those latter three stages is so that when my students come in and my colleagues, I can meet them wherever they are. If they're at the beginning, if they're at the end, I'll meet them wherever they are. If I'm at the very first stages, they have to meet me where I am. And I'm just not gonna be as effective as support. So, um, uh, Beverly Daniel Tatum says, historically there are three popular tropes for white people. You can be ignorant, you can be racist, or you can be colorblind. So, who wants to sign up? Like, <laughs> you know, sounds great, right? Like, nobody wants to be white when those are the ways to be white. And she says, but the thing is, when we don't talk about whiteness, we can't address the racial dynamics in our society. So white people need to show up and know that they're white and that that means something. So there needs to be a fourth way to be white. And she proposes being an anti-racist white person. To be anti-racist, um, or at least to be a white person trying to be anti-racist. Um, so people who are interested, um, it, one of the things that you do in immersion is you try to find white role models. Like, what does it look like for a white person to be anti-racist? So we put together this, my editorial team and I put together this book um, full of 15 stories of white people trying to be anti-racist. They've spent more than 30 years of their lives doing things that are anti-racist. Um, and then they write about it in this book so that people could have more role models. Because frankly, there aren't a lot of role models of what does it look like to be an anti-racist white person. But that's the goal is to hold out a different identity. There are lots of different ways to embrace an anti-racist stance. Um, a lot of it is, is, is listening and learning, but also leaning into the discomfort of these conversations and, and, and knowing that if it's uncomfortable, you're probably doing something right. That this is an uncomfortable conversation, but the discomfort is a sign um, that, uh, that you're getting somewhere. Um, let me see. So, so um, not being afraid to talk about race, even if it's an all-white group. Maybe even pointing out, next time you're in a committee meeting or a hiring team, like, we're all white here. And naming that, it can be so powerful to name that and to, um, and even if it's not an all white group, to say that we're a majority white group, we have one person of color on our team and the rest of us are white, so how's that gonna change this process? And it doesn't mean that you have to have foregone conclusions about what it means because it depends on who's in the room, but it can be very powerful um, to not be afraid to talk about race and to know that in predominantly white spaces we often have an unspoken agreement that we're not going to talk about it and that means we can't do anything about racism. So, let's see. I want to take a... Hmm. I'm going to skip this part. Don't look. Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Quay, do you have an opinion? Okay, all right, great. It's just like, I have a lot of things I want to tell you, but the truth is, it's less interesting than you talking to each other. So, uh, so here's the thing. I shared a lot about my own personal story and how race was not talked about in my house growing up. What I want you to do is you're going to take two minutes to share a little bit of your personal story with somebody um, sitting next to you. 
So if you have two people sitting next to you and there's somebody you know better and somebody you don't know as well, choose the person you don't know as well. Okay? You might have to go to somebody behind you or in front of you. There might have to be some movement. The question is, how was race talked about or not talked about in your family of origin? Are there any questions about the prompt? Yes? Well, it depends on how well you know them. You're going to have to negotiate. But I really encourage you to find one partner so that you each have two minutes to talk. So if you have a group of three, one of you say, I'm going to go find someone else. Okay? So um, I'm going to give you four minutes, and I'll let you know when the halfway point is. So the first person will have two minutes to answer the question, and then the second person will have two minutes. Okay. Welcome back to the large group. And I have to say, I think that if I get people to move, move around and find a partner that's not sitting near them, it might be easier to break apart because you're still sitting next to each other. So it can be awkward to extract yourself from that conversation. We want to hear just from two people. How did it feel and what would you like to, if there's anything else you want to share with the group, how did it feel to share this part of yourself with a colleague today? Uh, so Quay's going to run the microphone if there are two people who want to share. Okay, so there's another, another person in the middle here and somebody in the back. Hi, I'm Nancy. I got to meet Chad. He's a new history instructor. I work here in the kinesiology department. Chad and I had some similarities. We both grew up in families where race wasn't even discussed. Nancy, um, can I interrupt you for one second? Yes. Just make sure you're just speaking for yourself. Oh, I believe I am. <laughs> just because just okay. Chad may okay. or may not want everyone Any, to know. Anyway, the way it felt for me is I got to know Chad much better than I might have if I just encountered him on campus. Yes. Um, one other thing, if, as long as I have the mic, I hope you don't mind. When Dr. Curtis was sharing his story, I was reminded of something I learned years ago, and that is when we remain silent, we are getting silent approval of what's happening around us. Thank so, you. Um, maybe something could be said to the Amtrak people mm. so that these kind of things are taken care of in the future. Anyway, uh, you. back to you, Quay. Uh, if you Quay, if you pass the mic up, four rows up, there's somebody who, who wants it. Thank you. Um, so, my name is Anne, and um, I'm in the nursing department. <coughs> And I've been a nurse for 30 years, and so I run into many, many people um, over my career of all racial kinds. Uh, but having this discussion, and I was in your discussion yesterday, and kind of for the first time talked about my <coughs> racial upbringing. And, and for me to put that together, I knew what it was, but I've never been able to articulate that to anybody else. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of um, revealing to me, it was kind of sensitive to me to be able to acknowledge my, my experience, but also the relationship with my parents and how my um, journey to discover other things about race kind of destroyed my relationship with my parents. Mm -hmm. and, and, but I made that choice and I feel like it made me a better person, it made me a better parent, it made me a better nurse. And so I'm, I appreciate that journey that I'm still on, but when I reflect back, there are things that I really regret. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm really appreciating that in four minutes we could have the experience of people, again, getting to know each other better than they might have um, you know, after knowing each other for five years, because you're asking a question that that asks you to break the the norm of colorblindness and to, to talk about that part of your history that can sometimes can be very hard, but also for some people can be very invisible. Um, and and I, I appreciate um, you sharing about your parents too, and it makes me think that I should also mention about you know our parents teach us what they what they know. And sometimes that's what we need to know, and sometimes it's not what we need to know. And um, my parents have been on this journey with me for a long time, and they've given me permission to share the stories that I share with you, because they say, look, we didn't know, but hopefully it will help other people learn. So I want you to know that we have their blessing to, to, um, to share those stories, but I think that is a hard thing about 
about parents, and I know it's gonna come back to bite me because I'm teaching my kids what I know. <laughs> and one day they're gonna stand on the stage and talk about all the ways it was wrong. Right? <laughs> so that's coming for me. Um, so I'm gonna share a couple of just uh, a couple of uh, strategies for you to take away. I'm gonna flip through a couple of detailed slides that are not important, so don't get stressed out about the things that we're gonna skip. Um, um, first, that racial equity is the, is the opposite of racism. So if we want to create an equitable society, we actually have to be anti-racist. Colorblindness is a way of remaining neutral. And one of the ways that Beverly Daniel Tatum talks about racism is that it's like a river and it just moves one direction. And if you don't, if you our, if we're colorblind or if we're non-racist, which is how I was raised to be, we just get swept along in the current. And we're still going in that direction. And we're still benefiting from institutions and systems that were built to serve and, and, um, and uh, benefit white people, even though we don't have to do anything to keep those systems in place. If we want to be anti-racist, if we want a racially equitable society, um, then we need to move against the current. Um, which can be hard, um, and, it, and you know you're moving against it because there's much more struggle involved. Um, so, um, so, so that is why not colorblindness. And um, I, I also want to say that, um, especially for our students, it's important to know that talking about race is not racist. We cannot address racism if we don't talk about race. And so there's racist talk, which actively perpetuates racial hierarchies. But then there's racial talk. This is a, a distinction that come from, comes from anthropologists Omi and Wynan. They say racial talk makes it possible for us actually to talk about race and racism, talk about the ways that they're part of who we are, and also dismantle racism. So we need to distinguish, because for me it was like, oh, any, any mention of skin color is like, oh, that's racist. And racist is a really scary word. Um, but if we never talk about skin color or how race impacts our lives, then we can't confront racism. For students, they say that a positive racial identity actually supports social and academic success. And this is why our, each one of us, our racial identity is so important. Because when we have a strong, healthy, positive racial identity, we're going to be able to support students who have a strong, positive racial identity. This is an example of students with a Positive racial identity, these are young black men, they're just graduating from Harvard Medical School. This was right after Trayvon Martin was killed and they're wearing black hoodies under their white medical coats and they're holding a sign that says, they tried to bury us, they didn't know we were seeds. And they're talking to somebody and I'm like, who are you talking to? Because I think, in some ways they're talking to me as a white teacher who has taught young black and Latinx students and has, have not thought, you're going to Harvard Medical School one day. And I'm sure they had teachers like me who didn't see that in their future. And they're saying the world didn't, doesn't expect this of us. There's no stereotype about black Harvard medical graduates, right? And yet, that's where they, they went. But a positive racial identity helps you navigate a world that doesn't have that expectation for you. These are um, young women who took out uh, ads in their yearbook, I mean, words in their yearbook, we are not related. So. Again, a positive racial identity helps you confront even the little minor mistakes that people, assumptions that people make about you. This is a Mexican-American student holding a stereotypical picture of a Mexican person saying, this is not who I am, it's not okay. Um, this is a whole campaign from the University of Ohio. Uh, this is an example of a white man who has racial privilege, who's using it to speak up. He also has a lot of privilege because he plays for the NBA. Um, but Kyle Korver wrote this amazing piece in the Players' Tribune this spring about um, some of the assumptions he made about his black teammates. One of them got arrested and he assumed it must be his fault. Um, and then learn, beginning to learn about racism and realizing how much he was missing. Um, it's a piece I highly recommend for you or for your students. Um, our racial identities are our toolboxes. So when people ask me for tools and strategies, I think it's important to recognize that the tools and strategies, we can't carry them around with us if we don't have a strong racial identity. The racial identity isn't just another tool. It actually is the toolbox that we use to carry all of the skills. 
Um, and so that's why I spend so much time emphasizing the importance of, of, of really in a consistent and ongoing way doing things that help us develop our racial identities. So here are a couple of strategies that you could use. Um, one is the 21 Day Racial Equity Habit build Building Challenge, which is available online. Um, it's available at both Eddie Moore and Debbie Irving's websites. Um, they give you a different task to do every day for 21 days. And there's a really small journal that you, know, you just write one sentence about. It. But the idea is that if you do something different every day, for even just for 15 minutes, you can build new habits. Um, taking advantage of, of workshops and offerings like this one, um, but then also practicing talking about race in like reading groups. So I had a reading group with my partner, uh, who's a man, my sister, her partner, and um, a, another friend, five people. We were all white, and we wanted to build our skills for talking about race, so we would meet every uh, month, and we would read a book by a person of color, um, and the goal was not to rely on the people of color in our environment to teach us about from their experiences and what they know, but to go to the resources that are out there and then to not just read the books and learn from them, but to practice the conversation, to say the words that got caught in our throats, like white <laughs> and black and Hispanic or Latinx and Asian American and native, these, and, and white supremacy or institutionalized racism, whatever the word is that you're like, I don't like that word, it gives me the heebie-jeebies, I, I don't know how to, you know, to practice that conversation and that that can happen in white spaces. And it's funny because we often think, oh, white people can't get together and talk about race, there has to be a person of color there. And yet we never say that about any other thing, like white people can't get together and have coffee, white people can't get together and have a party, white people can't get together and have a hiring committee. There has, we should say that, we should say, there, has, you know, there should be people of color involved. But white people actually can, it's called caucusing, and white people doing their own work actually is really important because, um, because we often know different things from what people of color know, and we often have different skills that we need to build because of our life experiences. Also inquiry groups, so Quay has copies of my book called Raising Race Questions, which is all about creating inquiry. So as staff members and faculty here, to, to, to put forth a question. I have a question about how to increase racial equity on this campus. And, uh, you know, just like the guy for white women who teach black boys, the answer is going to be complex. You're not going to be able to ask a speaker after the talk and get the full answer. You're going to need to spend a year thinking about that question, maybe interviewing some students, interviewing the students in the group that you're thinking about that are successful on this campus. What's working for them? What are you doing that works for them? How, how do you need to change that for the students who are not successful on this campus? Um, but taking the questions that really gnaw at you, how do I make sure that girls are successful in my math class, or that Latinx students are successful in my math class? Whatever the question is, and spend a year inquiring into it. Um, so, uh, I'm going to close with this slide, which is just some of the things that I'm looking at now that I recommend, different resources, particularly this 14-part podcast, if you're more interested in thinking about whiteness, it's called um, Seeing White, it's on the podcast Seen on Radio. Um, this summer there's a new Netflix documentary out, it's four parts, it's about the Central Park Five, it's called When They See Us, it's very powerful. Um, if you're interested in the history of... Um, how Whiteness Came to Be a Thing, Race the Power of an Illusion is an ec excellent uh, documentary from PBS. So a couple resources for you to, to check out. Um, and uh, I just encourage you, my hope for every person in this room is that wherever you are today and in the next weeks and months that you take the next step. None of us can be five steps ahead of where we are unless we take each step in turn. And so, I, I, you, know, you may be happy with where you are, you may feel like, I, that, I wanna be there, but I don't know how to get there. My expectation is not that we're all gonna get to some artificial fin finish line, but that each of us can take the next step in our journey, um, and that will bring us one step closer to being able to serve students and help students navigate this society that we live in. And I'll close by saying, you can tell I'm not from Cuesta College because I'm not timely. It is, uh, <laughs> 
It is 10.33, and I have to run to catch a flight, so I apologize for running out. But I thank you for your participation and for your attention. I wish you all the best this school year. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, Dr. Michael, safe travels to you. I thoroughly enjoyed the community conversation that she led last evening, and it was um, really a great gathering here of individuals who are interested in the uh, becoming more skilled, taking that next step in their own journey in understanding race. So now we are ready to move into an exciting part of our morning as we recognize our employees of the year. And I don't believe we're at the beginning here, Clark. There we go. Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Curtis to assist as we recognize outstanding service. And we're going to begin this morning with our Academic Employee of the Year. This person communicates effectively with students, conveying patience, kindness, and understanding. They dedicate countless hours of personal time far above normal responsibilities working with Skills USA team students, ensuring they are focused and prepared for local, state, national, and international competition. They have provided exemplary leadership, promoting safety for the Engineering and Technology Division, the Skills USA program, and the creation and ongoing organization of the statewide FFA welding competition. They created the guidelines and rules for the FFA statewide welding competition, including the framework for assessing and grading student performance, and have brought awareness of Cuesta's excellence to schools throughout the region. This year's recipient of the Academic Employee of the Year is Rob Thoris. This is incredibly uh, humbling. It's uh, been a great 28 years uh, working here for education and helping young people. Uh, I'm having a little trouble speaking. Uh, <laughs> the Quester College has been awesome. Uh, the people here are amazing, uh, working for students, working with each other, helping each other, uh, working with guys like Mike Fonts and, and Gary Villa and John Stokes, and again, you know, there's all these guys that are just really value and uh, anyway I don't know what to say except for thank you and I, I'd love this job uh, that's it thank you so much <laughs> Now we're going to recognize the Classified Employee of the Year. This 
person is dedicated to student success and demonstrates excellence in the workplace by providing real solutions and embracing students' issues and concerns as opportunities, not problems. Their demeanor is replete with kindness and positivity, is calm under pressure, and takes the job, but not themselves, seriously. Their efforts and contributions are instrumental to the transfer articulation process for students at Cuesta College. This evaluations analyst is responsible for developing and maintaining an updated cross-reference system of colleges, universities, community colleges, and advanced placement scores, and whose work exemplifies the recognition of this distinguished award. The Classified Employee of the Year Award is presented to Karen Garza. provides an ongoing way to our students. The Management Senate Employee of the Year. This person is an inspiration to peers and staff and is an integral part of the college's enrollment and the achievement of student success. Their work ethic and commitment to excellence are exemplary and worthy of the recognition acknowledged by this award. They led the effort creating the non-credit triple SP plan and implementation for non-credit and were an active participant in the planning and development of the student equity plan. They are responsible for the implementation of non-credit programs the results of which exceeded 200 FTES for high school summer in emeritus. They also ensure compliance in recording and reporting positive attendance hours for all non-credit sections. They led the project to establish the North County campus as an official test site for GED certificates and facilitated student access to GED testing. They served as a statewide board member for Association of Community and Continuing Education, as well as on other statewide task forces representing non-credit and continuing education. They led the Slow County Consortium of the California Adult Education Program, which involves collaboration with the K-12 Adult Education Programs on all things adult education and non-credit. The recipient of the Management Senate Employee of the Year Award is Mia Grui. Award 
is named in honor of Dr. Marie E. Rosenwasser. This award recognizes an employee who uses leadership skills to tackle a problem, who takes some risk, is patient and persistent, and achieves a result that brings institutional change. Current leadership research has a significant focus on transformational change, and universally the research focuses on the vision of the organizational leader and how that vision leads to a lasting change enacted over time. In contrast, our California community colleges are expected to undertake transformational change in short order, and it is advanced through funding shifts and legislation. Yet, Cuesta College has not just one, but two exceptional individuals who have recognized the urgency of need and launched a collaborative model that intertwines the expertise of teaching and counseling faculty in leading the Guided Pathways Implementation Team. They lead from a position of engagement and inclusiveness. They lead with questions and not answers. And they share a passion for student success. In recognition for their outstanding leadership of Guided Pathways, the President's Leadership Award is presented to co-recipients, Dr. Lara Baxley and Heidi Weber. Hello, everyone. Um, 
This year's Teaching Excellence Award recipient is famous for making a dreaded subject for non-STEM majors accessible, doable, and even enjoyable. This subject has brought more students to tears than any other subject at any college campus ever. And she is incredible. This teacher calculates. It all adds up in her favor. You cannot subtract from her. She is indivisible like our great nation. She is not an irrational choice. She is no square, and she likes pie. <laughs> Who can it be? One of her students said, I fail math classes when I have bad teachers. I received an A in her class. And there's one little context for this one too. Because she only um, received F grades um, in high school, not across the college. <laughs> um, and so, also another student mentioned a similar thing. Um, said, I received my first A in her math class ever. Um, another student added, she generally cares, but make no mistake. She, she cares for students, but make no mistake, she will not put up with slackers. <laughs> One of her math colleagues revealed um, that her former students come to her class extremely well prepared, tightly bonded, excited about learning, and powered and with an expectation of having challenging, interesting activities. They push me to replicate what they experienced in her class. Um, and, and then the person added, this is the highest praise I can give to any other faculty member. Um, she has worked diligently to bring new ideas um, in pedagogy to her colleagues. Um, they all say that she is very humble, um, unassuming and kind. And so who among us um, deserves this honor? It, it, it is Denise Chelsea. <laughs> students who have crossed our paths. Um, I certainly know that they've enriched my life a lot. And, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a few minutes um, were able to watch the slideshow. Um, those slides really were a snapshot of what was accomplished in 2018-19 at Cuesta College. And I know as the end of spring semester and commencement rolls around, everyone starts to feel exhausted. And it's even at that point in time, it's hard to remember everything that was accomplished in the fall. And so the cabinet and then the management team spent some time this summer really reflecting on the work that was completed, the projects, the initiatives, the new courses, all of the things that had transpired over last year. And we really tried to gather that so that we could maintain a record and not lose sight of all of the great work that has happened because it's so easy to just get carried into what's next. 
right? We're just looking ahead at what's the next thing, what's the next thing, and it really is tremendous to be able to just be able to reflect and celebrate all that was accomplished. This has been a fantastic week here on campus. It has been wonderful to see all of the activity. I've had opportunity to help people find different locations to see our students coming in for Connect at Cuesta and the great energy around that. We had our scholarship um, recognition. That was tremendous. Um, we had a board meeting this week and that's always um, a great time to be able to gather and really focus again on the work of the college and what is happening here on behalf of our students. Um, flex activities were going on. Last night we had so much of the community um, leaders here to hear Dr. Michaels. That was tremendous. But I have to, I think one of the highlights for me was yesterday, the part of the volleyball team ran up to me and they said, do you work here? And I said, yes. <laughs> um, they said, we need a picture with a staff member. I'm like, yes, let's do it. Um, so I took a picture with part of the volleyball team. They were really surprised to hear what my role was. In the <laughs> But even better than that, here come another group running up, and I thought, okay, they're, on, they're on, clearly on a scavenger hunt. I'll, I'll do another selfie. No, they needed to arm wrestle. <laughs> and uh, so I got to arm wrestle with one of the volleyball players, and I told them I'd been doing push-ups, and so then she told the videographer, make sure it looks like I'm winning. <laughs> But it was really fun to get to connect with those students who are incredibly excited to be back on campus. So I'm going to start with a little bit. Um, we launched in the spring really with this idea of one and trying to bring together the huge number of initiatives. We looked at all the, the legislation that really is intended to drive us toward this one goal of increasing the completion um, at our colleges. And I wanted to share a little bit of an update in terms of the national number has shifted. And this um, comes from the National Student Clearinghouse Research Center, and they have posted the 2018 number was what we looked at in January, and now the 19 number. And you can see that there is a shift. This is, again, a six-year cohort. It's a national look at um, community college completion. These are students who said that their goal was a degree. And, um, but we see some evidence here that indicates the work that is happening not only in California community colleges, but across the United States focused on completion is making some impact. And I think that that's very exciting. I also wanted to remind us that the California community college rate is significantly higher than that national completion rate. And um, the number here, again, is from the scorecard from 2018. So this is the number we saw in January. And that Cuesta College does outperform our state average at 50.2%. And I am looking forward to see what these um, 75 things that we completed over the last year, the impact that those are going to have as well on our completion numbers moving forward. A major piece of our completion picture really is the quest to promise. And um, because in many cases, it, it's what allows a student to start. And you aren't going to finish if you don't begin. And so um, last fall, our incoming freshmen were the first group that had access to the two-year promise. And this is our first opportunity to look at their persistence, right? To see what kind of impact that second year is going to have. And um, last fall, we had 927 promise students begin, 600 of them are registered again this fall, and that's a persistence rate of 64.72%. And I'll tell you, I saw this number um, from Ryan, and I, I did not feel good. It, it wasn't the number I thought we were going to see. And I asked him if he could help give me some context. And so he did, and we actually have a comparison group of first-time freshmen who were not promised students last fall, and their persistence rate is only 26.97%.
So there you really do see the impact of the promise. And, um, but, but I think that we have some opportunity around having our students come back for year two. I think that, that probably more than 65% of them would benefit from a second year at Cuesta College and completion of their degree. So that's something that we're going to delve a little bit more into. There, I think there's a lot in that. Certainly what we're doing in dual enrollment and in, a, in our high schools, students may be finishing, right? They may have been at first time at Cuesta and actually graduated. And we want to see what that impact is in that number. This fall, we currently have 1,261 new Promise students coming in. Uh, that's tremendous. We know that this there is going to be some decrease in that number. Um, sometimes students change their mind. We know they withdraw, and so. But we will be keeping an eye on that. That number is about 150 above the highest number I saw last fall. So it is it is a significant increase for us. I had the opportunity this summer to spend some time with Chancellor Oakley, and it was a very interesting conversation. Um, primarily because he did not speak to what he was invited to come and speak about, um, but instead told his own story. He was asked to speak about the challenges he's faced as chancellor of our system, and instead he wanted to talk about his uh, teamwork and how he values his team. And so that, there was a little bit of a disconnect. But we did have some opportunity to ask him questions. And um, he spoke about the SCFF, our new student-centered funding formula. And we're going to touch on this a couple more times this morning, so I'm not going to give a lot of detail here. But what he did share um, is that his focus is going to remain on access in the student-centered funding formula. And what that means in terms of the formula itself is less emphasis on success, the measure that we do well on, and more emphasis on serving students from lower socioeconomic status. The Pell qualifiers um, and the, the California Promise qualifiers. And so that has an impact to our college that is not positive in terms of the funding formula moving forward. And it's very interesting in the context of what really helped the legislature to adopt the new funding formula was around student success and the message around we really are getting to drive a performance and student completion through this new model. So there's been a shift there. He did talk about the vision for success and um, that colleges had adopted the local college vision goals. Cuesta College also met um, those parameters. He spoke on guided pathways and that there will be continued emphasis on that. And he did say that there was nothing big coming our way, that um, he did not anticipate we were going to see new initiatives. And then we asked about AB 302 which is the uh, bill on uh, providing parking on community colleges for homeless students. And um, I was with uh, a group of other CEOs, presidents, and chancellors who were speaking with Chancellor Oakley, and the unified message from all of us is we want better for our students. Yeah. Um, this is, this is not a solution, especially when it's an unfunded legis legislative move. And the CSUs and UCs have received dollars to address homelessness and no legislation. Um, but he said that the chancellor's office would not be taking a position, even though he agreed that he didn't think it was good for our students. Um, but he directed us to assume that this will pass. And he said he will do what he can to help cover the cost. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how that comes into play. Um, Dan Troy is not here today, and so I'm going to very briefly touch on some of his areas, in particular around Measure L projects and, and our budget. 
And in terms of the budget, we do have our adopted um, tentative budget and we will see a final budget proposal in September. And more details on the final budget are going to be shared with the campus as they are available. Um, because of the changes to the student-centered funding formula, some of that is still being determined. Um, when it was first introduced, this was the switch. Remember, we used to be a 100% full-time equivalent student. Our attendance drove our funding formula. The new SCFF brought that to 60% of how we were funded. 20% was going to be based on student success, measured as um, completion. And 20% was going to be um, supplemental, which is the area that addresses low socioeconomic students. The new student-centered funding formula moves the student success piece down to 10%. Again, that's where we perform well. Our success is good. Um, but the hold harmless has now been extended to four years. And so we are not going to see an impact of this new funding formula um, for another, another year beyond what was previously anticipated. Measure L, the swimming pools are open. <laughs> Yay, and beautiful and being enjoyed. Uh, the new gym floor has been installed and I wanna thank um, our, our coaches and our faculty who regularly lose the gym, use the gym for your patience. Um, learned that part of the crew that was installing the floor was involved in a vehicle accident in North County and it has delayed a little bit the completion of that project, but um, it is beautiful. I actually had nightmares about the gym floor um, when I first saw it because it was had such significant grooving and wear in it, and so I am just thrilled that that is installed and our athletes are going to be on a safe surface moving forward. The data center um, is nearing completion. They're just a bit ahead of schedule even with that project and um, getting ready to, to do furniture installation and be completing that for a fall move in. And the R&B Schultz Early Childhood Education Center on the North County campus actually has steel sticking up from the pad now. That pro project was significantly delayed over the winter due to weather. Um, when we were getting all of the rain was when it was time to do the groundwork. And so um, it's, it's a, still slated to complete on time because we've had great weather this summer and opportunity to make up some of the delay that the project had early on. What's up next? So as Terry Reese was walking out the door, he said, you need to know um, over the next six months, 19 roofs are being repaired. <laughs> wow. So if the building you're in hasn't already had roof repair, it's coming. Um, the construction fences are going to be moving very quickly around campus as we try to get ahead of the rainy season as much as possible. Um, the, not only was it wonderful to have the water and to restore some of our state resources this last year, it really helped us to identify what roofs needed to be priority. <laughs> and um, we actually have had to move some things around in terms of the bond timeline to get roof repair earlier in the bond projects um, so that we don't sustain major damage to our buildings. And so in the next six months, there are going to be lots of fences up and down around campus. And there's gonna be the associated, sometimes unpleasant smell, there's gonna be some noise. And um, it's all about trying to ensure that we don't get major damage as the next rainstorms come. Um, if you're housed in a building that's not among the 19 that gets a roof in the next six months, all of the other um, buildings will have roof repairs over the next three years. And so it is, it is a significant uh, piece of the work slated for Measure L, and it's gonna be really important for the sustainability long-term of all of our facilities. 
So what we anticipate is that we're gonna see not just construction fences, but construction fences with some happy messaging and some reminders that um, it's inconvenient today, but it will be safe and dry tomorrow. Um, <laughs> and um, just know that it's, uh, for the most part, it's going to be short, very short-term projects, and um, every effort is being made to schedule with minimum disruption. With that being said, um, you notice there wasn't a lot of detail about budget. Uh, right before Dan left on vacation, he had attended the, um, the most recent budget workshops for the state, and he and I were not able to connect before he left, and so again, all, more budget detail will be forthcoming soon. But now, I'd like to introduce or uh, invite Dr. Mark Sanchez to provide an update from Student Services. Thank you, Dr. Good morning, Cuesta College. I'd like to give you an update on some of the key programs and services uh, Student Services has been working on uh, over the last uh, semester or two. But before I do that, I'd like to thank um, the faculty, staff, and administrators in Student Services, Academic Affairs, Grants, Programs, and Research for the excellent work they've done in bringing these uh, things I'm about to present to fruition. Our counseling department, they developed back on track workshops, both in person and online, for our students who are on academic probation and dismissal, with really the intent of trying to get them back on track to uh, move forward in, their, in completing their educational goals. So thank you to the counseling team for do, doing that. In addition, they developed what's called a student success contract in collaboration with students to outline key strategies for what that means to get back on track in the classroom. The Transfer and Career Center developed new workshops titled Transfer 101, UC TAG and CSU application workshops. In the fall, they're moving forward with um, workshops called Career Lab, where they're basically doing group counseling and career and major, and these are on Wednesdays and Thursdays in the Transfer and Career Center. And our University Transfer Day is on Monday, October 28th, from 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. 50 plus university reps have already been confirmed for participation on University Transfer Day. Outreach and Enrollment Services, our Promise Day has been calendared, Friday, October 18th, from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And our Student Success Festival is on August 27th on the Slow Campus and August 29th on the North County Campus. How many of you are familiar with the Student Success Festival? Yeah. That wasn't very exciting. <laughs> that wasn't a very exciting response. So just really quickly, Student Success Festival is an in-reach event where really we're trying to highlight all the programs and services that are available to our currently enrolled students. Um, that includes academic programs and just really trying to make sure the students feel connected with the, all the resources that are available to them on campus. We have a student support resolution coordinator. Uh, she works with students, faculty, and staff to facilitate resolution of student code of conduct issues, as well as uh, work to make sure students who are exhibiting any type of stressor and it's impacting their performance in the classroom get connected with support resources, including mental health resources. She coaches students on the seriousness of academic dishonesty issues and really tries to uh, get them to understand uh, the potential repercussions of academic dishonesty on their academic performance. And she identifies county, state, and federal resources available to students um, in terms of grants and scholarships. Uh, her name is Donna Howard, and she's at extension 3192, and she's in the Vice President of Student Services Office. Health services, mental health services. In the spring, we increased the number of hours. Uh, students have access to mental health counselors and interns. Um, the whole purpose for doing that was when we were running the data, um, we were noticing that there was an uptick in terms of the numbers of students who were experiencing different types of stressors from housing insecurity to food insecurity to uh, just different types of mental health stressors that were impacting their potential ability to persist on at Cuesta College. So 
uh, working with the team, uh, we increase the number of hours that students have access. Um, and so that's, we, we believe is gonna be a great benefit to our students. Also working with Transitional Mental Health Association, or TEMA, which is a community-based mental health resource agency. Uh, this summer we were doing group counseling um, on Tuesdays from 1.30 to 2.45, and we're currently working on a schedule for, for fall and spring moving forward with TEMA. So we're really pleased to have them available on campus at both the SLO and North County campuses. And we've also hired additional bilingual mental health interns for our students and particularly our Dreamer students and our North County campus um, students who may need access to bilingual mental health counseling. And our team has also been doing mental health and suicide prevention workshops this summer where they're using, using the question, pers persuade and refer our QPR model and mental health first aid. That workshop is not really designed to make everyone an expert. What it's really designed to do is to give uh, faculty and staff just some key tools on how to work with students who are exhibiting suicide stressors and to be able to refer them with key resources that are available both to them on, both on campus and in the community. If you're aware of the national statistics on college-age students and suicide, the numbers are skyrocketing. So it, uh, it really requires uh, colleges be responsive to this phenomenon, and so this is how we're working to approach that. Our veteran student services, we've expanded the number of hours that the veteran student uh, service offices are, are available. Uh, we've secured funding for textbooks, calculators, and classroom supplies, supplies for our veterans, as well as increased number of hours to mental health support for our veteran students. Um, really pleased and I want to thank the grants program for doing a lot of work to make sure that that came to fruition. We've formally built an international student program which is now located in the Transfer and Career Center room location 3131B and we have a program coordinator Aaron Parsons. So we've been serving international students for a number of years but now we have a formal location where international students can have contact on campus and we are currently working on a marketing and outreach strategy plan for our international students with the goal to really try to strengthen our pipeline of international students who are coming to Cuesta College. And then of course, there's an interest from Cal Poly in us being a first point of contact for international students and then they'll ultimately transfer to Cal Poly. So very pleased to be formally building that program. Thank you to Aaron Parsons for taking on the leadership challenge to make this work occur. We've now opened Monarch Centers, or what many colleges call Dreamer Centers. Um, we have a designated office location in both the SLO and North County campus. And really the, the fundamental uh, goals of these programs is to connect students with academic support and counseling, access to college support resources, which includes textbooks and calculators, uh, leadership and mentoring activities, and a citizen and legal rights workshop, which is provided by our community-based partners. And so, again, just really trying to create an environment where all of our student groups feel welcomed on campus. The, we were able to bring this into, um, into action by securing a private grant from a private organization based out of uh, San Francisco called the Catalyst Fund. And so they've committed to provide funding for, to Cuesta College for three years to ensure that our Monarch Centers grow and thrive in order to serve our community. So we're really pleased about that. <laughs> our Cougar Pantry continues to grow. We have a designated uh, food pantry on both the SLO and North County campus. You can see the hours and office locations. In, we're also continuing our food bank, food bank distribution every month. Um, That's the third Tuesday of every month from three to five at both the SLO and North County campus. And uh, we're doing something a little different under the leadership of Dr. Anthony Gutierrez. He's also sent an email out to faculty that if you want some food resources for your classroom or your cluster office, like granola bars, water, uh, please contact him and he'll have someone bring it out. And so what we're really just trying to do is students have different points of contact for food resources. And so um, 
his extension is 2354, and I know he's been a, he's been receiving a lot of inquiries already about taking food resources out to the different locations across campus. This summer, um, a leadership team put together an LGBTQIAP plus uh, resource webpage. Uh, and on this webpage, it basically outlines uh, different resources and allies that are available to our community of students where they can connect, where there's safe spaces, um, if they need uh, counseling or, or academic counseling, just really uh, being able to connect with the centralized location on campus. And so um, there's a web link here, I'm not gonna click on it, but it also includes a resource guide that the team has developed. And it really gives you some key strategies on how to be able to support our LGBTQ um, students on campus. And so really pleased that we're creating a, a broad spectrum of, of services and programs to support our students. What we're essentially doing, if you look at everything from, from a broad scope, is we're creating uh, an environment based on what the academic research is telling us, is that when students feel connected on campus, from a whole um, window of what their personal experiences are, they feel connected, they feel engaged, they feel supported the more likely they are to complete their education and goals on a college campus. And so that's really the frame by which we're doing all of this work. And again, I, I started this presentation off with thanking the faculty and staff, both in academic affairs, student services, and uh, grant programs, is because it's really through their efforts that these things have, have come to pass. That's my presentation, and I thank you for your time. I now have the honor of introducing you to Dr. Jason Curtis. Thanks, Mark. Well, good morning again. Um, before I get into my content, I just have a couple slides, and I won't take too much of your time. I did want to just say, since this is sort of my introduction to the campus community as a whole, um, that I'm I've been really humbled by the opportunity to step into the vacancy that was left when Dr. Wolf retired. Um, humbled by the opportunity to learn more about the college and all of the new things that I have to learn each day in this new job. And also really grateful to those of you who have taken the time to send me a message or come up to me and say that you're really excited that I'm in this job and that you believe in my ability to do it. Um, that really helps a lot. Um, as for the skeptics out there, or those who aren't sure that I'm the right person to do the job, I'm really grateful that you've kept your thoughts to yourself. <laughs> so let's start with accreditation. It's going to be a big year for accreditation, as most of you hopefully know. Um, Quest has been here before, seven and a half years ago. The Dean of Sciences and Mathematics was brought up into the VPAA role on an interim basis, facing some important accreditation issues. But I want to assure you that I really don't believe that this year is going to be like that time seven or eight years ago. Um, ACCJC, the tone and tenor of, of our accrediting agency has changed. And so my goal is to work with Kevin Bottenball, my co-chair on the Accreditation Steering Committee, and approach this year with some quiet confidence. We've done this, we can do this again, and everything's gonna go well. We've got drafts of almost all the sections of the ICER, the Institutional Self-Evaluation Report, already um, laid out. We just need to finish those up and assemble the document it's gonna be working its way through the shared governance process as the year goes on. So there's some new information that I'd like to point you to. Um, on the website, this is just the accreditation website. It's accreditation's right at the top where it should be. Um, there are two new links that might be of interest to you right under the picture banner. There's a link to uh, the committee timeline, how those different drafts of the standards are gonna be moving through the various committees on campus. And um, a spot for, as those drafts become available, for you to click, read the current draft, and provide feedback according to the timeline. 
Finally, I'll point out with respect to accreditation that our board um, just this just this week at its August meeting had an accreditation training from our ACCJC vice president. She's our liaison, Stephanie Droker. Um, that was a good training for the board and just helped us center and focus on what the year ahead needs to look like. So moving on, um, I just want to review a little bit about our enrollment, where our FTES, our full-time equivalent students, what those numbers have looked like over the past decade. Um, and I do this not to bring us down. The, the graph initially looks frightening. Um, my math colleagues um, from my former cluster will not forgive the, my abuse of the y-axis here. I've definitely compressed <laughs> it just to fit on the slide. But here's what our FTES looks like if you just look at credit face-to-face -face classes over the last 10 years. Um, you can focus on the, the blue line if you choose. The blue line is what we've actually claimed from the state. Um, so as you look at that, no, sorry, the blue line is our actual enrollment. The orange line is what we've claimed. And you can see that pattern of um, we claim higher every other year to try to keep the budget higher. So the blue line is the actual. And you can see that it's been trending downward. Um, there's no real argument about that in terms of our credit face-to-face -face classes. But if you, if you count the distance ed classes, and about five years ago we really started investing more in online classes and we've been adding more and more. We brought on um, Cynthia Wilson, our instructional design faculty, really helping people get into using Canvas. And so you can see that that curve is starting to level out a little bit. It's not quite as bad as it was before. And then if we add in the FTES from our, all our new initiatives, so our work at CMC, our work with concurrent enrollment with the local high schools, uh, the return of our emeritus offerings, actually the lowest point was um, right here in the 14-15 school year when I arrived at Cuesta and it's been going back up ever since. Oh, this is an ugly graph. I will learn what the background of these opening day slides is going to look like and I'll do better next time. Um, so just a little bit more about the student-centered funding formula. Dr. Stearns mentioned um, the phenomenon and some of the changes as the state has tried to implement the student-centered funding formula. You may recall in the spring, Dan Troy and I presented and there were still a lot of unknowns. And as the spring went on, we thought we had some clarity, but it turns out there are still a lot of unknowns. So let me try to talk you through this since you can't possibly see the legend. Um, just imagine, this is the 18-19 school year over here. And there are sort of four different points. This is this year, next year, and two years out. And this is our budget. It's hypothetical. There are no real numbers attached to this. Don't worry. Um, and the big dark green portion is the portion of our funding that comes from the FTES. The state's plan was to decrease our funding based on our actual FTES, based on the apportionment over the years. And we know that our FTS is potentially going to go down a little bit, depending on how we do um, see the previous graph, right? But that portion of the FTS funding is going to shrink. Um, the white portion here in the middle, that's our access portion. Don't expect that to really change too much one way or the other. That's based on the demographics of our community, how wealthy our students and their families are, if they're Pell eligible. Um, so it's hard to see that really changing. So the width of that white band is not, not changing much as we move forward. The gray band at the bottom is the success portion. That's the, our, our reward for giving lots of ADTs, for getting students transferred, all of the things that actually Cuesta does really well, as Dr. Stearns mentioned. Um, currently, that's 10% of, of the funding allocation is based on that success portion. It was supposed to go up to 15% this year, and then 20% and level off there moving forward. And if we continue to do well, as we have been on the success portion, 
there was actually a chance that this gray bar would push the whole thing up so that we might actually start to grow a little bit in terms of budget. Unfortunately, Governor Newsom came in and the, the legislature and the governor's office realized that colleges were doing so well at ABT production and completion and transfer, they couldn't afford this scale up. And so they decided to keep that portion level at 10% and it's not actually predicted to ever move off 10% anymore. So that's the big change since January. And what that unfortunately does to us, if that portion doesn't increase and the FTS continues to drop, we get a little bit of a gap in the budget between where we are now and where we might be three years from now. What's a little bit of a gap? Well, if that's around 5%, that's $2 million. So it is a significant impact from the decision that the governor and the legislature have made to not fully fund this success band of our funding. Okay, that's depressing. <laughs> I want to move on and talk about AB 705. You've probably heard a lot of talk about it. If you're in math and English, you don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, this is the law that required us to allow our students Based on their place, based on their history in high school, um, to place directly into transfer math and English whenever possible. We did a soft rollout implementation of AB 705 in the spring, and I want to share with you just some of the results from that because they're actually fairly encouraging. Now, remember what the state's goal in in passing and implementing AB 705 was was to focus on the completions. And so for each of these graphs, hopefully you can, or tables, hopefully you can see this, um, English 201A, Math 230, Math for the Humanities, and Statistics, Math 247, we compare the number of students in spring of 2018, a year and a half ago, and the number this past spring, their success rate, all told in the class, and how many total completions that that translated into. So you can see in English 201A, this spring, just with the soft implementation of allowing more students into transfer level English, having more sections of it available, we had 81 more students complete transfer level English in the spring. Um, in Math 230, Math for the Humanities, we had almost 100 more students complete. Yes, the success rate, which was very high in that class, did drop a little bit. We have to take account for that. But we still had many more students complete transfer level math by taking that course. And then look at statistics, where the success rate went up by 6.6%, and we had a lot more students taking it. So we had another 100 students complete transfer level math that way. So that's a, that's a pretty good result for us. It does sort of prove the legislature right, which can be uncomfortable for some of us sometimes, <laughs> but it is working for our students and that's ultimately what matters. <laughs> if you weren't aware, um, this fall we have a new tool online so students can uh, do some self-guided placement to try to determine which math and English course might be the right one for them to start in based on their area of interest. And speaking of areas of interest, let's take just a second to talk about Guided Pathways. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't again recognize the great work that Lara and Heidi have done in helping all of us get organized. So the big work in the spring and the summer has been to create, and I know this is even worse than the other one, sorry. Um, uh, this is a screenshot of one of our program maps. So we're one of the colleges that signed on to a program mapping project. Um, eventually this tool is going to be released to our students. It's not available to students yet, but what it shows is what they should take in each of their four semesters um, in order to complete within two years, if that's their goal. It recommends the courses that they need to take. It shows how those courses are linked to one another, if one's a prerequisite for another, and just basically gives them a clear pathway of how to get to that outcome that they've selected. And the students choose that based on their area of interest, and then they sort by which degree or certificate they're interested in. 
So we have now created 131 of these program maps. They're, we're getting ready to roll them out to students, um, hopefully sometime this fall. And also want to recognize that um, we just finished Connected Cuesta, the three days of Connected Cuesta. And I, I'm going to claim that that was our first real major student-focused event that took into account these areas of interest. So students were placed into groups based on the interest that they expressed. So they might have been directed to health and wellness or STEM or one of the other areas of interest. Um, areas of interest, you might have heard them called meta majors. For now, I think we're going with area of interest as, as the appropriate term. And that brings me to the end of my message. So I'm gonna bring Dr. Stearns back up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our marketing team has put together for us a beautiful um, introduction of our new employees and I skipped right over it. And so I'm gonna make up for that and we now are going to meet our new um, Cuesta family. Jason Curtis, Interim Vice President for Academic Affairs. Hello, this is Guillermo Álvarez. I am a full-time professor in mathematics. Hi, I'm Lori Buckholtz, a librarian at the North County Camp. I'm Yuko Caravallo and I'm the Athletic Equipment Manager. Dean Harrell, Ag Plan Science, Tenure Track Faculty. Ryan Lowenstein, full-time faculty, mathematics. Amelia Marini, tenure track faculty, English. I'm Sarah Miller, tenure track faculty, English. I'm Brittany Mojo and I'm fine art ceramics. Cheyenne Wynn, Biological Lab Technician. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Mark Tannell, and I am the new custodial supervisor. Allison Herson, campus police officer. Matt Holub, low voltage electrician. Andrea Echeverri, Student Health Program Specialist. Griffin Mitchell, Financial Aid Specialist. Christine Schullers, Financial Aid Specialist. Rebecca Weber, Human Resources Specialist. team who worked on that. We're going to um, ask them to do that again and include more videos. I think it's just great um, to have the opportunity to see a name um, and hear from them as well as getting a, an opportunity to see what our new employees look like helps to connect us. So I'd like to start um, each year with, with sharing a, a little bit and um, if you don't mind, I'm going to be really real here for a minute. I want to express my deep gratitude to all of you here. Last year was a pinnacle of my professional life. I was thrilled to be able to come to Quest College and to join you in your incredible work on behalf of students. And it ended up being the most difficult personal year I have ever faced. And um, it's not my story to tell. Um, it belongs to my son. But I will say this, that when they have a um, degree in hand and a job and are financially independent, you really think your role is done. And that's not the case. <laughs> and we um, had a very vivid reminder that we are still living. And um, last year did not bring on a personal level at all what I expected. And um, the people that are the community of this college sustained me. Even without knowing me. And I want to say thank you. You made a tremendous difference, not only in the lives of your students last year, but in the life of your president. And I deeply, deeply appreciate your support. Um, there are very, very few people in this space who know what we faced. And yet it didn't matter. I, I regularly received encouragement, and I thank you very much. I am um, so glad to be here, and I am so excited about the work that is happening here and the commitment to students that I see demonstrated every, every day. So all of that came about because when I tried to find a picture to share, I didn't have any. Um, it hasn't been a picture year, but um, we did take some time away this summer, went as far as um, South Lake Tahoe for a weekend, um, and then we went camping, and we camped in Paso Robles, we camped in Carmel, and we camped twice in Pismo. Um, and it was great. Um, we got to, on those short trips, and yes, that is my Jeep pulling trailer, does a great job. Um, lots of time like this, which is our favorite. Those are our girls. Um, on top is Opal, because she always needs to be first and followed by Olive, and they are Dachshunds, they are three years old, and they absolutely are in charge. Um, so that was, that was our summer vacation. We did not venture far, we did not venture long, but it was great to have some time um, to be able to recharge and to think about this year and what we have coming. And part of what we did last year was to establish local college vision goals in alignment with the Chancellor's vision for success, 
and the goals were to be in these five areas and I just wanted to share with you what our goals ended up looking like. And I say ended up looking like because those of you who are involved know that the data changed sometimes hourly um, that we were asked to respond to. But this is where it landed and this is what is certified at the Chancellor's Office. The goal of a 20% increase was set by Chancellor Oakley for all of our colleges. And so you can see that our goal for associate degree completion in 21-22 is at 1,073. And that's, I think, an exciting target for us to have um, as we are moving forward. Um, our goal around transfer is an increase of 35%. And this um, is challenging for Cuesta in particular, our colleagues at Allen Hancock, some of the San Diego community colleges, because they are only at this time counting transfers to CSU and UC, and we do not have a transfer institution. So um, this is an area where um, we do very well when it comes to transfer, but it's not necessarily to those selected institutions. We do have students that choose privates, that choose to go out of state, or um, to online, um, or to universities that have online programs that provide a better fit for students um, locally. Unit accumulation. This one has been interesting. Um, of all of the numbers that we saw, this is the one I thought we wouldn't see change much. But our original, um, the data we were provided showed us at a unit accumulation of 82, which was really close to 79. And I thought we were really doing a great um, job in terms of being pretty close to that chancellor set target of having um, our students who complete be at 79 units. The later data that came out showed us at 87 um, as an average number of units, and so we do have a little bit more work there, um, but certainly the AB 705, the implementation um, that allows the students to start in the transfer level English and math is going to play into this, um, and we are already, already seeing that. The workforce goal is interesting in that there's so little data <laughs> um, being provided. And um, so the target that we have been given with some data is around um, CTE students who report being employed in their field of study. And this is, this is not on EDD data, this is really the student saying, yes, I studied um, in the welding program and I am working as a welder. And so we are currently at 69%. The target has been set for all colleges to be at 73%. Um, what is interesting here is that we have some programs where um, our students report at a much higher level in terms of working in their field of study and others where it may not be as closely matched. Our equity goals there's a lot of data, a lot of detail laid out in our local vision goals um, document, and that's available on the website, and we'll make sure everyone has a link to that if you would like to take a deep dive and see what that looks like. Just as a reminder, um, the goal is that by next year, we would reduce our achievement gaps by 40%. And that by 26, 27, that there would not be any achievement gaps. In other words, there would be no disproportionately impacted groups in our student demographic data. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> so just earlier this week, the Board of Trustees adopted their goals for 1920 and um, approved goals for me as well and I just wanted to share three of those areas in particular that really intersect with what we are talking here today and align with some of the priorities of our institution and the first is around fiscal stability and really with a focus on enrollment um, innovation and enterprise as ways to ensure that we are fiscally stable as we are moving forward. And especially as we continue to see changes with the SCFF, make sure that we are being responsive, but that we are also um, really 
being innovative in our thinking about what is it that we can do. And what's exciting about that to me is we have a board of trustees that's very interested in new programs and thinking about the kinds of things that would, would provide different opportunities for our community that would bring a different, um, a population that isn't already coming to Cuesta College, what would bring them to campus. Um, accreditation certainly is high on the list of importance for all of us. And um, I appreciate Jason's comments about that. Certainly ACCJC is operating differently. Their expectations are different. Their interaction with colleges is different. I can avow that the training for the visiting teams is different. And so we will have a different experience than, than what has been um, the pattern in the past. And the last piece really is around integrated planning. Um, ensuring that our, our plans are maintained and followed and with a particular emphasis on looking at ways to expand educational opportunity to our South County residents in particular. So here's some good news about our enrollment. Our summer was up 2.2 FTES from last summer and while that may not be statistically significant, Ryan, um, <laughs> Last summer was excellent. It was very, very strong, and we raised our target for this summer, and we hit our target, and we were, we were large enough to make up what we missed our target by in the spring. And so we are seeing um, student interest in summer, and um, we'll continue to look at that. As we look at fall of 2019, I don't even have a number to show you today because I can't make sense yet of the number of where we are at. We are in the midst of such transition. We are, um, over the course of the last week, we've been averaging, picking up about 40 FTES per day. So that target is moving and it's moving in the right direction. Next week, we know it will be all over the place as students try to determine what they really want their schedule to be. Um, and so we will have a, a better sense of where we are at for fall um, in, a, in a few weeks. I will tell you it looks to be a, roughly around 130 below where we were at the same point in time last year. But there's so many variables in that, including our dual enrollment and, and when someone actually enters enrollment data from one of the high schools, that it's really hard to have a, have a very accurate picture. But we are watching that closely as our students are registering. So one of the things that I realized this year is I spend a lot of time inviting people to come see me and to stop by my office. And then I look at my calendar and either I'm not in my office or I'm in a meeting <laughs> or something. And I thought I keep, it, it reminds me of back in 2012 when we were still open access institutions and anyone could come be a student but there were no classes available. <laughs> I, I feel like that's what I have done to the campus and I really want to, to fix that. Um, what I don't have is a name for it, um, but we're going to establish two dates in the, in the fall, and we'll do it both on um, the San Luis Obispo campus and the North County campus, and two dates in the spring, where I'm gonna have like an open office hour for the campus. We'll have a little bit of um, coffee or lemonade and just an opportunity to gather together if you've got questions, if you just wanna have conversation, um, but to just establish so that there's a regular opportunity that you know is going to come because relying on space in my calendar has not worked. And so we're, we're going to schedule that and share that. But I need your help because I really would like for it to have a name. And so I'm looking for suggestions and the winning suggestion will get a, a coffee gift card. <laughs> so so they put on your creative thinking hat and, and help determine what that will be. But my apologies to those of you who did stop by and tried and um, I wasn't as available as I had imagined I would be. So with that, we have a highlight reel from graduation 
that is going to take us into lunch. And are we ready to go? So this is this is a short two minute, um, just really walking through the great commencement activities that we had this spring. And then I hope everyone will join us. We have um, what I've been told is going to be fabulous food. We have vegan options, vegetarian and carnivore choices. Um, <laughs> And we'll be serving over by the cafeteria, by the 5,000 complex. There are tables set outside, there are tables inside, and you're welcome to sit wherever you are comfortable. And then at one o'clock, the um, joint faculty meeting will convene right back in this space. Thank you very much, and have a great fall. It is an honor to welcome you to commencement 2019 the 54th annual graduation ceremony of Cuesta College. Thank you for joining us this afternoon as we celebrate and recognize academic success and achievement of our graduates through the conferring of degrees. planned out, sometimes you work hard, sometimes you do everything, and you end up on a different path in life. And I'm not saying don't do that, I'm saying embrace it. Your life might take you different places than you expect. Faith, family, and friends are what got you here. Lean on them as you move on in your next step in life. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. The education you will and have received isn't a right. It's a privilege. Go make the best of it. Thank you. Reflect the excellence that's in you. Never settle for good enough. And whatever you do, what will bring you happiness is serving your fellow people. I know the journey to get here was not easy, yet you remained steadfast in your resolve to complete your goals, and you did. Job well done. You have earned a college degree. Congratulations, class of 2019.